Huh. Uh, who's been to two? Three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Um, there was something else I wanted to say. It's early. No, okay. We're going to go straight in. Dom Perry, uh, I saw him yesterday when I was doing the who's a developer, who's a uh, whatever. He just had his hand up the whole time, uh, which will be relevant for his talk, I think. Many hats. Um, but please welcome Dom Perry. Uh, take it away. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Can you hear me at the back? So for a second there, I thought I was going to have to do some tap dancing or something different. Um, not, not quite as, as good as Kent at storytelling, so it was a bit of a panic. But uh, luckily, you know, with a room full of IT people, and none of us can deal with printers or projectors. <laughs> and if you can, I've probably got a job for you. <clears throat> so I'm Dom Parry, uh, CTO of Simply Financial Services. We're uh, I guess it's still a startup very much. We're in kind of month 18, 19, somewhere around there. Um, and yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, is everyone having a good time so far? Cool. Thanks to the speakers yesterday. I really enjoyed all of those talks and learned a hell of a lot. So I hope I can share something in return. So what we do simple is simply is a simple issue life company. What that means is it's no complicated medical underwriting, no blood tests three easy medical questions, uh, four questions or five questions related to pricing, and that's it. Uh, you can get cover. So our fastest online sign-up at the moment is two and a half minutes for someone signing up with life, disability, and funeral cover. And where we try and position ourselves in the market is kind of competing in terms of market with like the likes of Sunland Sky, Vodacom, FNB, all those kind of life, new, new life businesses. but. On price, we're trying very much to compete with the fully underwritten guys, so different life uh, and, the, and, and you know, the sorts of guys that do ask for the blood, the blood tests. And that's really what we're trying to do is shake the market up a little bit um, and provide a much lower price to the people who need it, but be very competitive on the top end as well. So that's just a little bit of what we do. Okay, so how do we do it? Um, essentially, we live very much by the principles of this book and also very much in terms of what Kent was talking about. We're hugely experimental as often as possible, as much as possible, but it's not just in the tech, right? It's in every single aspect of what we do in the business. So if it's from marketing to which, which ad uh, picture gives you the best response with the same messaging, which messaging gives you a better response with the same picture, you know, we kind of iterate through all of that stuff all the time and we measure it. Um, and take decisions based on, on evidence that we, that we see. Right? So it's not about like my gut feel said X, Y, Z. It's really about measuring what the difference was. Did this do something to sales? Did it do something to persistency in the business? And figuring out what to do next based on that. And the other thing is we're very much a human-centered design organization. And what that means is actually very scary. We talk to people. We go out there and we find users in the street. Literally, we walk outside the building and we go find people and we show them what we do. We try and take them through the application. We use pre-prod so they don't have to actually buy anything. But um, yeah, we actually get feedback, uh, which, is, which is really good stuff. And I'll show you an example of how that's helped us. Um, many, many rapid inter interactions, as I, as I said, iterations, sorry. Um, and, you know, <clears throat> I kind of agreed with a lot of what Kent was saying in the first day, but some of the stuff that we tried to do was put infrastructure in place to enable fast iterations. And, and I'll talk a little bit about that later. So it's not like we build millions of tests first and that we, we do some testing. We're not crazy. But, uh, yeah, we, we don't try and build in and like the, the whole set of plumbing for everything in a massively disciplined way, but we do try and leverage some building blocks and iterate around those. And then lastly, like something we live by is as simple as possible. The, the terminology we use internally is blowtorch. We blowtorch everything, whether it's code. Deleting code is our favorite thing. Um, <clears throat> and blowtorch the site, make the process simpler, take messaging away, make it cleaner and just understandable. So that's what we live by. 
And here's sort of an example. So this was um, probably about a month ago, what you would have seen had you landed on our website for a quote. And we thought this was great. We had a designer. The designer made this thing for us. And as you can see, the sliders, you can choose how much cover you want. There's check boxes. Uh, you can say, I want this or I don't want this. And you kind of go through it. And we used a combination of things like hot jar, talking to people, some UX feedback sessions. And we figured out that actually no one could see the check mark. No one knew that that was a check mark, right? Um, no one knew what the amounts meant. So what is that 400,000? What? You know, small things like that. And we found a lot of people trying to click on the progress bar. You know, they're, they're not buttons, right? So we cleaned it up a little bit and came up with something completely different, which is what you'll see here. And it was just through careful testing, measuring, seeing, you know, if I change the check box. And we figured out that we were hiding everything in the color, and now we've reversed it. So the color, the important stuff is blue. You know, how much I get. The, the, the bar now tells you what you want to do with it. You want to slide me left and right. Whereas the other one was just kind of a circle. People weren't getting it. Um, so that's just like a little bit of, of what we practice in, in that experimental philosophy. Um, <clears throat> yeah, the team. So I think the key message here is we're a really small team. This is the entire tech team, including myself. Um, but the recent change to this was adding two people. So we've hired two people in the last three months. Um, and so we built out the, the, the majority of what we have to run an insurance business with a team of initially two, then one more later. Um, and for us, you know, the scaling conversation is actually a little bit inverted. So it's how do you scale just work that needs to be done with a really small team, okay? Um, so keep that in mind as we, as we, as we talk a little bit about uh, what we've done a bit later. Um, just one comment in terms of, you'll see roles. I'll talk about what that is later. <laughs> so you'll see some roles on the screen, and I've left mine blank because as CTO of a startup, your role is just to do the stuff that nobody else wants to do. Um, and and it's, it's, it's been a, a real eye-opener for me. Okay, so I'll try not to bore you too much, but um, I just wanted to go a little bit into the detail of how I got to working as a CTO of a startup. Um, called it The Path. It's a, it's a really dodgy series. I don't know if anyone saw it, like a culty series about The Path. This is not that. It might be a little bit like that. So <clears throat> does anyone recognize this as kind of the typical career path that we're all taught we need to do? You know, I kind of start at the bottom as a developer, and then I've got to be a senior developer, and then like, if I'm really good, and maybe I'm lucky, I can be an architect. Um, and then I can get into program management, um, and then more into management. But basically, if you, if you think about it, what you're doing is leaving behind some of the stuff that you used to love, like the technical stuff. But actually, it's fine. My career is progressing. I'm moving up, moving up the ladder. Um, but is that kind of the typical feel? I think this room is possibly maybe not the right room for this kind of context, but for me it certainly was. In my career, that's what I was driving towards until very recently. And uh, why do we do that? Because we're kind of expecting this kind of thing. You know, the higher I get, the more money I earn and the happier I'll get. But possibly it's a trap, right? The more you move and the more you might earn, because it's not guaranteed that you'll earn more, but you might end up there. <laughs> And certainly that's, that's been my experience, and I'll share a little bit about that with you now. Um, so I started my career as a developer um, straight out of university, but it didn't last very long. <clears throat> they put me into, I had a bursary with, with a large telco provider. I got stuck into a network planning division, and in the network planning division they needed someone to write uh, macros for Excel. Developer. <laughs> So <clears throat> it was about eight or nine months worth of that, and I just couldn't deal with it anymore, so it was time to get out, and I managed to find myself a new job. And as I did that, they were like, no, don't leave. You'll have to pay back all this bursary money. So they managed to find a spot in the solution architecture team for somebody who knew nothing. And uh, they were like, we haven't filled this position in many years, so off you go. Go and, go and learn some solution architecture. 
And I did that for a long time. I was very lucky to meet someone at the time. We had some great consultants in helping restructure and teach people how to do architecture because no one knew how to do it anyway. So it was just like the rest of my colleagues, which was cool. And uh, I did get taught a hell of a lot of stuff, um, but I also didn't know a hell of a lot of stuff, right? Um, from there, I moved into in, uh, enterprise architecture. What is that? Um, and then into IT strategy, getting even more abstract. And I, at this point, I kind of started to feel like I'm not doing anything real. Like, when do I get to do real work? Um, and so I tried to go backwards a step and jumped into integration architecture, which was great because it, I was working with a much more technical team and we were solving real problems, but still not getting my hands dirty. Um, and then I jumped ship from that business into consulting. I worked for IBM as a consultant architect. Um, then got a position as chief architect at a different large telco provider. Um, and then, what does that say? <laughs> right. Um, that sort of unhappy feeling of like not getting anything done, it stuck with me for a long time. So I was like, there's got to be something else here. And I figured out, well, you know, I've kind of done the architecture thing for many years, because this was at that point, it was about nine years worth of, of, of architecture in various shapes and forms and strategy and, and, and PowerPoint and, and stuff. And uh, so I decided to go and do something completely different. So I went back to IBM, because the chief architect thing was for a telco uh, in South Africa. Went back to IBM, but into the sales division, so completely different. So industry solutions, SME, there's a little bit of pre-sales technical work, but largely own a solution portfolio, run around Middle East and Africa and tell people about it and, and try and get them to buy lots of IBM kit and stuff. But it wasn't great. Um, I learned a hell of a lot, and I'm glad now that I did it, but it was, it was a very special time. Um, so I felt I'd learned enough of that sort of different view on the world and how business really works. And I jumped back into sort of as technical as I thought, because obviously still chasing the career, got to move up, IT strategy director. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, um, again, didn't, it didn't last very long. And I then took a role back at the telco which I'm being very careful not to say the name, because, um, where I was chief architect. Because the work we were doing when I was playing the architecture role was um, very much to do a massive transformational program. Squash all the good work they'd done over many, many years and replace it with a big Oracle stack. Shout out to Oracle guys. Um, and so I, I, I think I was duped into this role because they said they needed me back to help with the stuff I'd been working on before. But I arrived and they were like, it's so cool, you can be the program manager for this. It's like, what's that? So, um, yeah, so I stuck with that one and delivered the project. Um, we got right to the second phase of, of, of getting that stuff deeply entrenched. Um, <clears throat> And then it was time. It was time to move on. And I just, out of the blue, an opportunity rose to do something completely different, which is my current role, uh, startup CTO. So just a little bit about, like, you know, the architecture space for me felt very much like that. It was, it was the office suite, and it was meetings. And then it was more meetings and meetings. And, like, after a full day of meetings, you get to do more PowerPoint for tomorrow's stuff. And it was... It was not great. Um, so yeah, pretty much, um, I felt that I was getting more and more and more miserable in my career. Like eventually starting to have thoughts of like, well, maybe IT is not, not it for me. It's got to do something else completely. But I did learn some things along the way. So <clears throat> some of those lessons here, strategy is important, right? So I think running around aimlessly is not going to get you anywhere. And uh, in terms of what, what strategy is, and I've come to learn that strategy is about the goal, it's about the end point. It's not really about the path to the end point. And if you get too involved in the path when you're doing strategy work, it's, it's not kind of going to add any value um, when actually 
all the values in the delivery. And we spent, I mean, at the first job I, I worked at, we undertook no less than three massive strategic exercises, planning entire transformational journeys that never happened. They never even started. And we probably spent about two years doing that. So strategy is great. You need to know where you're headed, but don't get bogged down. Um, you need to actually deliver stuff to ship features and ship, ship products. <laughs> Similarly but different, architecture is really important, right? Um, it's a little more about the road, a little bit more about how I'm doing it. But again, if you're defining kind of the rules of the game, I think that's good. And showing people kind of what, where to do stuff and how to do stuff is, is also OK. But there's this danger in the profession of architecture, of building these ivory towers. And the phrase here that sticks in my mind very much is, thou shalt do this, thou shalt do that. You will use this technology to build it. I don't care what your business domain problems are. We have decided it's this. And that's very harmful. Um, you know, creativity goes out the window. People feel they have no autonomy to make any decisions. And actually, then everybody's miserable. Um, again, standards and frameworks are helpful. Um, I think many of us use them day to day in our code um, to, to help us figure out where we are, what we're tack tackling. But uh, it's easy to fall into this trap of stifling out new ideas because the framework says we're going to do it this way or that's how it's going to be. It gets really entrenched and then everything has to be done that way. Um, and this is at all levels. I mean, the telco industry is, I don't know if anyone's in the telco industry. So you might know ETOM, the TMF standards for, for how to structure all your IT, IT applications. It gets very much like very preachy to the point that all the vendors in that market have started to conform to ETOM um, and how, how they've got to do things. And it's OK in terms of standardization. It means telcos can pick and choose different COTS applications. But uh, you have to be really careful. I mean, not to preempt my own talk a little bit, but I'll, I'll tell you about what that did to me um, a little bit uh, just now. And then stability is a great goal. I think it sounds really obvious. We all want to drive for things that don't fall over. Uh, we want some kind of predictability out of our systems. But stagnation is a real killjoy. You know, so again, uh, don't drown innovation. Business moves, right? So we want to build stable platforms, stable systems, but we still want flexibility. We still want to be able to add things and do new things without, you know, without stagnating. And then <clears throat> techno technology might build products. So if you're in financial services and you're not selling physical goods, um, even in the telco space, it's very much technology that delivers products. And we get very hung up as technical people of like, you know, we've got to get it perfect. It's got to be 100% right. Um, and if it's not, we've like failed as a technologist because it's not perfect. But at the end of the day, businesses don't survive without sales. And so we often will try and build something and like, you can't have it yet, it's not perfect. But actually, at the end of the day, what we need is to ship something so that we can sell something, so that we can get our salaries paid. Um, and then that's real, program management. <laughs> yeah. So <clears throat> I used to be an architect. So I spent my life looking into things like you know, frameworks and stuff I was talking about earlier, lots of process modeling. This one on the bottom left corner is a little framework we did for how you, trans how you do big transformation programs for companies. You have a new one on the one side and the old one on the other side, and you connect them with a bus. And you it's great. It's good in PowerPoint. Um, it's been, but you know, there, there's some value in this stuff, I guess. Um, but I think if you're anything like me and actually fundamentally deeply, tech deeply technical, taught yourself to code at a young age using Turbo Pascal and stuff like that, this is not going to be a happy place. 
I can like almost guarantee it. But also, I didn't learn a whole lot of stuff. So after all of that, working in many different businesses, like some big names, I knew, knew nothing about infrastructure, like not really. I could kind of tell you that there were different boxes. And even in, I mean, I went on extensive IBM training to go and sell their kit. But I really knew nothing about how to put that stuff together, like nothing. Um, I knew nothing about dev tooling. So I'd worked a little bit with developers. I knew Git was a thing. I'd never touched it. Um, and it was really kind of refreshing out of my recent journey to, to, to figure out that I knew nothing about ops. <laughs> Um, you know, pr people face real problems once you throw your code at them. And uh, yeah, there's a hell of a lot of stuff that I didn't know there. I knew absolutely nothing about scaling. In my program management job for that large telco provider, we spent about 50 million rand on a performance testing project phase. Just hammering the, the Oracle stack over and over again and trying to get it to handle the existing volume and maybe a little bit of next year's growth. 50 bars just getting and tuning and performance testing and hitting it over and over again. And I was like, How, why is it so hard? It can't be that hard. Come on, guys, figure it out. <laughs> Knew nothing about data. Um, <clears throat> one of the jobs, the that, that strategy director job, was actually for a business that only did data and information management stuff. So this was really surprising for me. <laughs> having to now, in my recent job, do some of this stuff, realizing actually you know nothing about this stuff. Like you're, you're a salesman basically lying to people for, for lots, of, lots of time. And I knew nothing about CSS. <laughs> <laughs> Who does? <laughs> So then there was this journey. Um, so I got this job as the, as the CTO of a startup, but I, there was this kind of overlap period of about two or three months where I, I told it that the new business, like I need to wait, I've got to start on the 1st of June. I promised this other company I'd finish this stuff off. So I had the job, but uh, still very much in my old mindset. And uh, <clears throat> that's me. There was this... Um, cycling race and I came home from the cycling race at about a hoppers five in the afternoon and the power had tripped and I couldn't get into my house and the kid, kids were hungry so they were getting louder and louder and louder and then I realized ah oh, there's a courtyard that I can get to and the courtyard key I have on my key ring because um, we had obviously bolted up all the doors from the outside so we couldn't get into anything so I climbed up on, over the roof and the next thing I landed pretty badly. So my, uh, I landed, my heels shattered, kind of like how the doctor described it. He's like, it's broken like an egg. <laughs> so there's about 12 screws in there. They're still in there, but luckily I can still walk. Nearly had to even tap dance earlier, thanks to the projector. But what that did is it gave me 12 weeks of time where I could do nothing. I, was not allowed, I wasn't allowed out of bed for 12 weeks, foot up in bed. Um, and so I started to dig. Um, and I can't even remember who sent it to me. Someone sent me a single YouTube link to a Google Cloud conference set of talks. I think it was the 2016 GCP video set. And I started watching some videos. And I remember distinctly thinking to myself, like, what rock have I been under for this period of time. I mean, as, as my entire career has almost been, barring maybe one or two years, has been exclusively in the telco space, where we used to dream about like dynamic provisioning servers and like one day when we're big, we'll have VMware and we can do all this cool shit because we've got like seven data centers worth of hardware. It'll be great. And uh, here were people just like click provisioning stuff Auto scaling, I was just like, this can't be true. This must be a lie. Surely this can only be for dev environments. We never run like stuff like this in production. But remembering I knew nothing about hardware, so it was, yeah. So I remember that distinct thought, like, where have I been hiding? And and that kind of gave me a fright. It's like you're about to start a job as a startup CTO, and what are you going to do, Dom? You're going to go in there and put an Oracle stack in. <laughs> you know. 
So I yeah, started finding more videos. And um, you, might, you may recognize some of the faces. So Greg Young. Um, anyone know who Greg Young is? CQRS, event sourcing. If you're interested in any of those topics, that's your guy. Um, you'll have to just <clears throat> suck his dislike for Java. But uh, he's, yeah, great talks there. But that, like, the, the concept of event sourcing to me is just completely ridiculous. I mean, why would you do that? Um, and then I found Rich Hickey. Um, and Sam Newman, microservices guy, the one who wrote the book, Jez Humble, pipelines and CI, CD stuff. And, you know, I kind of went through this journey watching specific people's videos, diving into any conference talk video material I could find, um, lots of YouTube, and started attending as many conferences as I, as I could. My first scale conf, though. Sorry, John. Jonathan. And, uh, and then I was like, well, this stuff's great, so I've got to try some of this. And I remember putting on Facebook and Twitter saying, does anybody know what IDE I should be using if I wanted to get into development again? It was really kind of at that level. Dom was great at PowerPoint. But I dived into like Udemy, Node School. Um, later on, the, the four with the dragon thing around it is for Clojure. Uh, Clojure is a great little programming language if you don't know about it, you should. Um, and started doing tutorials and writing code. So in hospital, like, what the hell is this JavaScript stuff? Why? This is meant for, like, really badly written websites. Um, <laughs> and then uh, also started reading a lot of books. So, yeah, um, I guess the message here was I had not invested any time in keeping up with technology at any sort of level of detail in all those years, which is kind of a massive fail, right? You're the architect, you're supposed to know about, no, you don't know about all this stuff. And uh, it, it was a massively humbling experience, but also a very exciting experience, like learning about stuff that's been out there for a while. And uh, then I started this new job with kind of all this shiny new knowledge buzzing around my head, not really knowing what, what to use and what not to use. But we sort of had to deliver on a very short timeline. Um, so it started in, in June, July, and started doing some design work and planning and like what do we need to do and what do we build. Then we, we engaged a vendor to help us because, you know, obviously couldn't build it on my own and I hadn't been able to hire in that short space of time. And basically, by the time we started building to the time we finished and pushed something live was about two, two months of building. So granted it wasn't, we weren't, weren't building that much. We built our web sales channel along with all the stuff around that and how products arrive into the system and we built a call center uh, application for salespeople to be able to use and sell our products in that two month period. But this was a period of me constantly feeling like I have no idea what I'm doing every day. And nothing summarizes it better than that. So about a week before production go live, um, we had built all our, all our apps to de deploy to Google App Engine. So we had a Node.js application, front end and back end. We we're going to deploy this stuff to, to production in a week's time, trying to get stuff, you know, building the CI pipelines and stuff, getting them to deploy to App Engine, and then we learned what Google really means when they say this service is in beta, because it's going to change. And uh, we couldn't deploy anymore to App Engine with automatic deploy scripts. It just wouldn't work on, on a particular day. I was like, I've got a week to go. And uh, I was like, well, how else do we do this? We have containers, so obviously Kubernetes, great. Yeah, we're going to use Kubernetes one week before go live. Um, and the funny thing is that I suppose maybe because I was just in the mode of learning about stuff and doing stuff, but actually the documentation for, for Kubernetes was so good, we went live one week later. Um, and we had deployments and pods and, and services, and I even got auto-scaling working because you know, obviously we need auto-scaling because 
the three people who might find our website. <laughs> I won't go like but, but I guess the, kind of the point is if you're not having to set up Kube yourself and you're kind of using it off the cloud and someone's done the hard work, it's doable. It's doable. If PowerPoint boy can do it, anyone in the room can do it. Um, yeah, so, so that was a fantastic little learning exercise. And so what we built here uh, is kind of a summary. So we started off with very much an end-to-end -end JavaScript solution. Sort of halfway through that build phase I was talking about, I discovered Clojure. And I was like, no, 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 we've, we've made a mistake. We should, we should use this thing. Um, but it was obviously not the right call to make. We had to do, we had to go live. So <clears throat> we, we finished our initial launch using um, ex very lightweight Express backends, React and Redux on the front end. Um, and, you know, from a CI perspective, it was a little, little bit of experimenting. This thing's really annoying. Uh, backwards and forwards and picking something that would work. But we found GitLab very luckily quite early on. And it's been truly incredible. I mean, I, I know you've heard people talk about it before, but it's been great for us as well. Um, so that's what we use. And that, that for us, delivers on um, every aspect from holding our repos all the way through to pushing through to production. So everything is automated. All our testing is done. Um, we don't allow builds to go to production without a click, but it's a one-click deploy. Um, and and I, I guess <clears throat> the message there in terms of what I was talking about earlier, the initial go live in the two-month two period and all of this stuff running was largely a team of two, and we scaled to have one more person for about four weeks and then back to two. And so for us, automation of that stuff was just a no-brainer, just because there was no other way we were going to survive. Um, so continuous integration, con continuous delivery sort of principles underpinned everything we did. And that's really what I meant earlier when I was saying, put in some basic foundational stuff to help you iterate and help you experiment. Because if you have a small team and you have to do all this stuff manually, it's just going to kill you. you know, you're going to take away from from um, your ability to, to do more iterations and build out more features. Um, and then, of course, as I mentioned, we run everything on Docker. We probably went a little overboard um, because even our build processes run inside containers, inside GitLab. Um, but it's been cool because we now know when there's something wrong. You know, it's really easy to debug because we have the build container. We can just run the build inside the container. It's very simple to debug that stuff. And that all runs on uh, Google's Kubernetes engine. Then there's all the Google products you can see, the things we use, uh, PubSub, Cloud Data Store, BigQuery, uh, Cloud Data Flow, which is an amazing tool. I'll show you a little bit about that just now. Um, but you know, echoing what Dob said yesterday, massive fan of using other people's stuff. Um, I am not a fan of using commercial off-the-shelf applications that deliver business functionality. Uh, I, in my, just my history has completely burnt me. And, you know, so my experience of like the Oracle stack, sorry Oracle, but the, the plumbing tooling is fantastic, but having applications that aim to deliver functionality for everybody also mean that they don't deliver the stuff you really need, or possibly the stuff you really need. And we, we kind of felt a lot of pain. I mean, one, one of the partners, when we went live with our first phase of that big project, the, the comment was like, the screens look pretty, but we can't do any business. Like, literally, we broke the business by putting this big thing. So yeah, I mean, the key, 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 things, key things again is <clears throat> fine tooling and stuff that's available that's, that you can use. Tiny team means I don't have time to run boxes. I do not have time to provision things and look after them and patch OSs and keep them running. I just can't do it. We do have a few things running that I need to do that for. But, but if, if I can get it as a service, that's how I'm going to get it. That's kind of my, my attitude, but not, not for the application layer. OK, so and one of the principles that I didn't mention before here, but 
one of the things we built the whole system on is an event driven, it's not event sourcing in, in our case, but I really love the concept of event driven architectures and for two reasons. Um, number one, everything is quite simple and if you're able to build everything that just has to, any component just has to receive something, do a piece of work, dispatch another action and I'm done. It, it really simplifies every little problem space you're looking into, right? It's, it's really simple. I'm going to get these things, I'm going to do something, I'm going to send off something else, and I'm just, I'm done. Um, I don't store state, I don't care about state within my applications ever, um, and it's happy days. But um, the noise you heard a little earlier is actually this guy. Of course, that's uh, broken the presentation. I was, I was hoping I could show you this uh, thing live. I have, I have this thing live, but basically there's a picture as a just in case. But basically, running an event-driven um, architecture has allowed us to do this kind of thing very simply. This was a pet project by one of my devs. It took him a day, and uh, he produced this thing which basically reads events off of our events queue. It knows what they are, and it maps it onto a dashboard. So we, the sound you heard earlier was actually someone buying on our website. Um, we have other sounds for when they buy different kinds of products, so we know, and it's great for office morale. But the fact that the whole architecture is built around events means this kind of stuff was very, very easy. I can go and subscribe and listen to them and do some cool different stuff. Um, and then another thing I've learned is there's no such thing as big data. Why am I saying that? Um, it's a little bit contentious, I know, but I'm, uh, this is kind of my feeling. I'll show an example. So with a little machine with one CPU, 3.75 gigs of RAM, we run a streaming pipeline of events, and that streaming pipeline of events keeps our data warehouse at most six seconds behind production at any given time, one CPU. And that box was so not busy, I ran two pipelines in parallel on the one box because it was just not doing anything. Right, so that's just one small example. Another small example from a batch perspective, so this is a slightly more complicated ETL job, fetches lots of data, combines stuff, does some filtering, and then sends it off somewhere else. Same size box, 1,600 elements per second, okay? And that's just because that, that's the data that I have. But uh, here's someone else, Graham Polly, who's a great kind of guy, uh, advocate for this stuff. Um, and there's 10 and a half million elements per second running on 50 VMs. And the difference between his code and my code in order to do this is nothing. All he's done is configured the service, Cloud Dataflow, just said, use as much infrastructure as you want. And it just happens. And kind of so the, 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 the reason I say things like there's no such thing as big data because you saw BigQuery yesterday and you see Dataflow today and they're not the only tools but they're just two examples of this stuff. Like really, we're in a space now which is quite exciting. The, the tooling has matured so much that you don't have to think as much about this. There's no like big scary thing anymore that, that you have to talk about. Okay, so the shift, what did I learn 2.0 through this exercise? Spoken about this already, instead of pre-integrated off-the-shelf stuff, build only what you need and nothing you don't. And as a startup, for me, that was quite key. We have a huge backlog of stuff that eventually people realize we actually didn't need. So lots of requirements, lots of new stuff that happens, but we don't build it because we don't have the resource, but actually that lag creates a really healthy tension. You build nothing you don't need. And then this one was key for me. Instead of specialized individual with very specific skills, just find curious, wonderful human beings that love technology. So when I hire someone, the only thing I'm looking for when I'm in an interview is how curious is this person. That's it. The rest we can teach. And <clears throat> just a little bit more there. Becoming an expert in something might feel great, but learning something completely new is often much more rewarding. So I used to think I was the telco expert, um, but yeah, hell of a lot of stuff I didn't know. 
And then, uh, yeah, just to, in, in, in a little bit of summary, you know, automation keeps the team small. All the data all the time is kind of a motto for us. That event-driven architecture has allowed us to keep a log of events. We stored every single event that's happened in our system since inception. We have about three and a half million of them, and those are really good for BI, incredibly good. Um, one day when we're big and we get into machine learning, I have a nice training data set available to me. Functional programming has been fantastic. Um, not that I want to like go out and big at stuff, but that whole concept, it matches really nicely with the event-driven architecture. Um, pure you know, inputs of the same kind give you the same output every time. And so that we use that in the small in our code. We write functions for everything, but actually it models quite nicely into the large because I get a pub sub message, I do something with it, and out comes an outcome at, on the other end. Um, build only what you need and nothing you don't. Hammock-driven development is a, a concept that Rich Hickey rose, and I think nothing describes this better than a quote from someone in my team. He says on Slack, I'm doing mostly hammocking today, and the more I don't write code, the less code I have to write. <laughs> yeah, so let ideas percolate and settle and like don't always start things straight away. You know, that's, that's kind of the message there. And then lastly, stay curious. I lost curiosity along the way and it caused massive unhappiness. And like right now, there's not a day that I don't absolutely love. Like I kind of leave the office getting dragged off my keyboard. It's literally like it's been amazing for, for 18 months now. So, you know, long enough for the, for the shine to kind of dull a little bit, but I'm still loving every second. And I still know nothing about CSS. <laughs>
The what requirements, sorry? Like the regulation. So you obviously have to comply to a certain set of standards. Yeah, absolutely. So um, we ride on the back of an old mutual um, license. We have a regulatory person um, who helps us you know, manage that kind of stuff. So what, what we've done with our product framework um, is we've tried to build some of that regulation framework into how we construct the product. But the product model that we've built is very much like Lego blocks. So experimentation can happen within that envelope very quickly. Uh, just with config, we can roll new products out in like an hour. You know, it's like done. And we deploy at any time of the day. It doesn't matter. Um, but we do have the luxury of um, someone else to make sure we comply. But what that does do is constrain us a little bit in terms of how fast we can do it. Because when we ask them for a compliance opinion, they give us a proper compliance opinion. And their lawyers look at it, and their compliance people look at it. And you know, we've got them down to about two weeks. For an insurer, that's not terrible. We would like it to be faster. Um, but it is really an environment where everyone rolls up their sleeves. Our CEO every day is doing whatever's needed to be done to get stuff out, whether he has to sit and write the, the document that the guys are going to go and um, check up on and see if it's compliant, you know, from our chief actuary to ourselves. We're all, we're all pitching in um, to, to get that done. So it's, it's tough. Um, we would like to have more hands, but we also have really supportive shareholders. Um, who are in, in the insurance space as well. Not in the life space so much, but, but they've been super supportive and also rolling up their sleeves and helping with that stuff. Okay, last question. <laughs> <laughs> um, when you were busy figuring out how to get coding again, um, did you go through the free code camp and did you start the GitHub repo? <laughs> I only learned about that yesterday. Yeah, unfortunately not. No. Cool, thanks very much. Thanks, everyone.